Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 60. And before we get into it, let me just tell you about all the different things that you could do for us. That would be awesome. So first of all, hit subscribe if you are watching us in full Technicolor on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio version, it'd be super awesome. If you give us a little star rating, scroll all the way down, leave us a little review, because that would mean that our podcast gets found much more easily. And we would love you for it forever. Anyway, that being said, we're going to kick off with episode 60 right now, please welcome LA-based headshot photographer extraordinaire, commercial and aviation photographer, just in case you didn't know that, and trained actor. Give it up for Mr. Dylan Patrick. Dylan, how are you? Hey, man. I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me. How are you guys doing? So we, Fantastic. We are good. We are good. How's, the, um, how's, how's life over there? Because we are in the middle of a heat wave over here in the UK right now. It's, you know, it's not too bad. I actually, I've been working on a retouching a job, so I haven't even gone outside today, but it's, it's Los Angeles. The weather's always nice. You know, uh, it's kind of hard to beat when it comes to weather. It's really perfect year round. So it's starting to get warmer though. The summers by August, it'll be pretty hot. Yeah. Well, this, this door has been shut now for what five minutes. Yeah. Oh, so you guys are melting on the the table, table, man. Look at that. (laughs) <laughs> Look at that. So Dylan, people, I think most people would know you um, as the, so the creator of the cinematic headshot yeah. as such. And um, and I know you got started uh, with headshots in New York City. So how, like moving from New York to LA, how are you coping with the difference in weather? Like that's, is that difficult? Well, I, I, yeah, I love the difference in weather. I mean, it, it, the the tricky part about shooting in New York was always... Um, I had to book two days for people. So it was always a primary day and a backup day because the weather, you know, is very unpredictable in New York and in New York too, you know, the wintertime, I would just kind of shut things down. Occasionally I'd shoot somebody if, if they really needed it, but it's, I shut outside. So it was just too cold. Um, strangely enough though, sometimes the cold can kind of wake people up and they, Mm -hmm. they get really alert. So there was the few times that I shot in the winter, it was like I'd bundle them up in a blanket from like here down and uh, <laughs> give them some tea or something. And we'd run outside and shoot for, you know, five or 10 minutes. And then they go back inside and warm up. And sometimes that energy, people are like, okay, let's do it. Um, the, so it actually helps sometimes. But yeah, in, in general, moving to LA, I like the weather better. It's not humid in the summer. It's not overly cold in the in the winter and fall. I can shoot year round if I need to. So it's it's been nice. I miss um, I miss the cultural aspect in New York. Mm-hmm. L.A. just doesn't. You know, L.A. feels like one big suburb of somewhere. Probably New York. <laughs> like it feels like <laughs> it feels like all the people that wanted to live in New York but didn't want to deal with the city were like, let's make a suburb over on the West Coast and we'll yeah. just live there. And you know, everybody's got a house. It's very disconnected. It's yeah. um so there's some of that kind of cultural energy that I think is not here, but there's plenty of other cool stuff. You know, you get a you know, you get a burrito and you go on a hike. You know, that's kind yeah, of well. <laughs> I'm so fine. That's it. That's it. So when we go next week? Yeah, as soon as we as soon as we're allowed to fly again, uh, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Because that's still not oh, happening. You guys are, over here. Yeah, you guys got to come out and visit. Oh, we will. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's definitely on the cards for sure. Good. But we've got an expensive few years coming up. I know, but yeah. but you know, things like at the moment, of course, we're still like you know, we're not allowed to leave the country at this point. Really? Okay. Because you know, I mean, yeah. lockdown. Like things are opening up again, but travel hasn't. Um, okay. So I, I think they just started letting us fly internationally to some places but i you know you know how americans are i don't i don't don't get out of my own country nearly enough so um (laughs) i i'm honestly unaware of where we are in terms of international travel which is we embarrassing and stereotypical all at the same time probably (laughs) we we can we can travel abroad we've got um traffic light system haven't we Uh, well yeah well we've got a couple of red countries that we okay. absolutely are not allowed to travel to. Then we've right. got this massive, basically the rest of the world is amber, where <laughs> the, the guidance is basically you can go, but don't go. Right. That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's the guidance. Yeah, you could basically quarantine, um, you know, in, in the country of your destination uh, for whatever, two weeks or whatever. And then when you come back, you have to quarantine again. But then they also charge you 
like a ridiculous for the privilege. Yeah, for the yeah. privilege <laughs> of like staying in oh, a town wow. is like seventy okay. hundred, whatever yeah. it is, you know. So it's yeah, it's no just fun. no, it's not mm. realistic. I mean, you know, so we're kind of, we're pretty much cut off at the moment. I mean, at least we're we're now allowed to, you know, leave our houses and, and like meet other people, you know, yeah. within our little bubble. So it's that's you know, it's a step forward compared yeah. to what it was. Yeah. I mean, compared to that's... where we started this podcast as well, you know, as as all of our listeners know. Right. Um, this is like a total our product of the pandemic because yeah. <laughs> we That's just awesome literally though. had, yeah. I mean, we literally had nothing else to do. You know, everything got canceled and that was it. Well, at least, you, at least you guys were productive. Like I tried to work out. I did a couple of jobs, you know, I watched a lot of that. I was very unproductive during the pandemic. Like I, yeah. I feel, you know, I feel like you get on social media and like some of your friends are like, I learned a new language and I yeah. did, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> No, I did, I did none of that. I walked yeah. my dog a couple miles every day. It was great. <laughs> yeah. do, do you feel like you actually had, you needed that break though? Because I'm willing to bet you've been back to back for many, many years now. Um, so strangely enough, there was only maybe a couple of months that were real solid where I didn't work. Um, headshots have obviously been slow, but yeah. you know, as you guys know, I do a lot of other commercial stuff too. So um, a lot of the hospitality industry was shut down and I photograph a lot of hotels, but a number of my clients were also right in the middle of, uh, large scale renovations or new construction. And so in some respects, it was kind of an ideal time to shoot because there were nobody, there's nobody at the hotel. Um, that's my dog. <laughs> there's nobody at the hotel and, uh, you know, it, it's quiet. And, and so I ended up doing more work than I thought I would do. There yeah. was definitely lulls and, and I did appreciate, um, having a break because it was, there was a lot going on. We had my father-in-law down, um, and we were kind of watching over him for a few, a few months, two or three months. And then, uh, it was just nice to kind of reset and enjoy life a little bit. And uh, I think, I think a lot of people did that, which, which yeah. we should do more of. Hopefully everybody learned a big lesson, which is, Hey, you know, life is short. Maybe yeah, enjoy yeah. it. You so. know, I found that um, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, I think, and um, that, you know, we, we had bits and pieces. We had more work coming in for certain things like, you know, cause things were shut down. It meant, mm -hmm. People wanted some more video related stuff done here and there because, you know, yeah. and we, we do some teaching as well for, for, okay. for music. We, we had a lot more stuff related to that going on too, yeah. but you know, it's just bits and pieces here and there and nothing like it was. And our work started, started to pick up again. Yeah. I'm finding it really, really hard to manage my time. I don't know how to do it anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's still a quarter as busy as it might've been. And now suddenly I'm really, really busy and I'm just, it's, it's also, it. of course, because we started a lot of things during the pandemic yeah. that we didn't do before just to keep ourselves busy. And, and, you know, and these things are ongoing, like this podcast, for example. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so like, so this is now all like happening on top of what we would ordinarily be doing as we're getting busier again, which is, you know, which is cool. It's just how it should be. Mm -hmm. But there were, there were a number yeah. of things, um, a number of weird kind of things that happened throughout the pandemic in terms of jobs, like very similar to you, I shoot, um, uh, sort of on the side, I shoot industrial architectural um, okay. Photography. Yeah. So it's basically, you know, uh, large distribution centers, industrial mm -hmm. uh, complexes and stuff like that. That's um, nuts. I literally and, did. I literally picked up a client doing that exact same thing for like two months, right at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. It's and like, it, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. They're, they were, they were making money. They're like, oh man, you know, Amazon orders went and you well, know, next thing you know, they're like, Hey, can you photograph our large distribution yeah you know exactly it was unbelievable and, and the cool thing about that was of course um you know these areas are so vast that like covid wasn't an issue you know it basically right. it just went right mm -hmm. you, you know spent all day and, and you're not gonna meet another person like yeah. within 300 yards of you so there's yeah. no problem you know so so it was it was relatively easy um but then i got one call for a job where this particular online retailer that is very famous. Um, set up a COVID lab, oh, like wow. a, like a, a secret COVID lab type of a thing that had to be that needed to be Either. photographed. <laughs> yeah, that needed to be photographed, and that was wow. surreal, man. That was surreal. Um, that was I a bet. really surreal job. That's that's a very interesting. Pro I love when random things like that come into the email because it's like, yeah. 
you know, one minute you're shooting one thing and it's like, Hey, will you photograph our secret COVID lab? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sure. What yeah. what could go wrong there? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> did, did we ever though. find out why they built that? Well, I mean, it's been every, very recently. It's been in the news that they're increasing oh, the amount of the amount of labs. Um, so it, I think originally it was a thing where they were testing their workforce. You know, so it was oh, an it was, internal thing. But internal. I, I think because they built up so much capacity, um, not only in Europe but also in North America, actually. Um, that now right. some of the testing capacity is now used to analyze tests that come in from external sources, yeah. I, I'm guessing. But, you know, at the time it was literally like, okay, you've got to sign this thing. You're not allowed to talk about it, blah, blah, you know. Sure. Um, and, you know, you can charge us whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Let's, let's keep exactly. that. That's amazing. But you know, I mean, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is like there, there were some there, there were some uh, opportunities in this which which were kind of weird and actually strangely fun. Um, and yeah. just you know, shooting that complex was was really interesting because when else do I get to sh shoot a lab? Well, in a lab, and then even just the logistics warehouses themselves. Yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, there's there's a there's a whole logistical supply chain world yeah. that we don't really see like you see the trucks driving down the road mm -hmm. you drive by these big massive warehouses but when you go inside yeah. it's it's like simultaneously the most amazing thing and also like the most depressing thing right because it's yeah. like all going to be garbage one day yeah, yeah. Um, but but you walk around and it's just like a million square feet of like you know booze yeah. and and toys and yeah. elevator parts and it's, it's See, crazy the, and then <laughs> yeah and then you add in a covid lab yeah. and and uh there's all kinds of weird you know like um i think there's there's a whole new genre of just like pandemic related photography now because yeah. it's like in the hotel world it's like they needed pictures of somebody like cleaning a bed and a mask you know or there a hand sanitizing an elevator you know so there was a there's a lot of companies that did a lot of that stuff that will probably continue to some degree moving forward so um lots of lots of crazy little niches to to stick your nose in they got COVID photography. It's a, it's a new, yeah. it's a new niche. Can you, uh, yeah. can, can you smile a bit more? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. More. <laughs> yeah, more expression in the eyes, please. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. We need more dramatic lighting on this. I yeah, think. yeah. <laughs> can you squint? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the squinch. Yeah. Cool. Stick your chin forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. So. Okay, so let, let's roll back a little bit when you when you first sure. got started um, in New York because the, the one thing that struck me, you know, when I first came across um, uh, across your your headshot photography, and uh, just to kind of clarify, headshots is what I do a lot of too. Awesome. And so you know, um, and and of course, um, you, you know, you you always try and look for inspiration and see what else is out there and what kind of you know what kind of looks there are and you know, um, and and so what I found when I looked at, at your stuff was that um, there's a very specific, well, first of all, there's a very specific, very cinematic look to it, hence the cinematic um, headshot. But the fact that it's um, predominantly shot outdoors is something that's actually uh, relatively well known over here in, in London because a lot of headshot mm -hmm. photographers in London um, shoot outdoors. And that's because uh, rental prices are so or rental fees are so high that a lot of people can't mm -hmm. afford to run a studio. And so, you know, and, and, uh, accommoda yeah. Yeah. and accommodation yeah. is so small that you can't, like apartments in London are ridiculously small. So you can't really, yeah. often you can't just can't, you know, turn your, turn your flat into, into a studio. So people shoot outside. And so there's almost like a certain similarity that's, um, that has sort of developed over here in London for probably for the same reasons. But when you, when you first got started, um, I know you sort of trained as an actor originally, mm -hmm. and was yeah. it was it sort of a natural thing for you to fall into shooting uh, to just photographing other actors, or how did that? Work? Yeah, it, it it probably came easier because of that. Mm -hmm. I so when I got out of acting school, I obviously needed to get my own headshots done, and um, I worked with a guy named Ron Rinaldi, who became 
my best friend still is to this day. And uh, he's in his late sixties and mostly retired now, but this guy was basically the Peter Hurley before Peter Hurley. Um, he was one of the first photographers in New York to shoot digital. He shot 30,000 actors over the course of his life, you know, his career, more than that. Um, early Matt Damon and early, you know, Danny Glover and I mean, all kinds of people. And, um, and, and so I kind of met him and, and we became friends and it really, what ended up happening was I studied acting for film. I moved to New York. I didn't, I didn't have any real, uh, I didn't have a ton of financial support. I'm an only child, single mother. Like there, I had to figure out how to live in the city. And so acting, you know, I got a couple small roles and I, I auditioned a little bit, but it really kind of ended up taking a backseat to just survival, um, which is kind of, I fell into bartending and, and, uh, and I kind of, you know, I did that for a while and, and I met my now wife and, and at one point there was this conversation. I'd always been into photography ever since I was a little kid. Uh, my mom was married to a photographer for a while, and that probably instilled some curiosity at a young age. Um, and I was like, you know, let me let me try this this headshot thing. I, you know, I like what my friend Ron was doing, and and uh, there was a number of other photographers in New York that that I liked their work, and uh, I was like, let me give it a shot, you know. And so I started working obviously with friends of mine, people that I knew, you know, a, a lot of my friends were, you know, bartenders or waiters or, you know, worked in catering. And most of that industry in New York is all made up of, of actors. And so it kind of obviously gave me sort of that natural door opening into that world. Um, and it, it was helpful that I could relate. There's a lot of photographers that shoot headshots that have never taken an acting class. And some of them are great. It's not, you know, it's not really a knock one way or the other. It's really just that because I had studied it and I had studied it specifically for film, it kind of gave me um, a comfort, I think, maybe with some of my clients that like, hey, you know, I understand what you're going through mm -hmm. sitting in front of this. And I understand what the headshot means to them um, because the headshot for an actor is the storefront of their business. And so a lot of times what happens is, is um, actors are very, you know, sensitive people and and they put a lot of weight on getting headshots done and so there's this you know elevation of stress involved with the whole process that I really just try to take away and I try and apply that to any headshot client that you know gets in front of my lens it's like hey this is really just about showing you as you are every day like you don't have to be anything for me just sit down put on this shirt let me take your picture like you know, let's not make this rocket science, you know? Um, so that's kind of where all of that, you know, played a part, I think. The first thing I actually wanted to ask before we actually dive into um, uh, the actual cinematic, cinematic headshot itself sure. is, well, there's two questions. Back in the early days, one, are there any movies that we might have seen you in? And two, before you decided to go, you know, acting like, it's not really panning out right now. I need to, you know, I need to live and whatnot. I'm going to start taking some headshots. Were you a photographer at that point? Or did you start to learn how to be a photographer at that point? I would say that I started to learn to be a photographer at that point. Um, to answer that question, I, you know, I don't think, I think, you know, certain people, obviously, if you're curious about a camera and you start picking it up and you find you like it and, you know, there's, I, I, there was a lot I had to learn. And my, my friend Ron, my headshot photographer was like, I think it's great. You're getting into headshots. I'm not showing you anything. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and that's not true. He, he did help me in just kind of conversation about things that, you know, struggles that would come up. Nothing was ever really technical when it came to learning about F stops and apertures and ISOs and all that kind of stuff. That was a lot of just sort of school of YouTube, mm -hmm. um, you know, reading anytime I had a question, uh, you know, there, it wasn't so common at that point, you know, Facebook wasn't around social media, you know, there was MySpace, but it wasn't really the thing. And so 
you couldn't just jump on and into a Facebook group and ask a million questions about photography. Like you had to go find the answer yourself. So a lot of that was just self-taught stuff. Um, Joe McNally was a huge influence on my work. Um, mostly because I really liked the way he blended natural light and flash. His balance of the two was, was something I was after. And I saw the application for it within the headshot world because the as you guys know shooting headshots outside is awesome but if you're not using flash you'll you're at the mercy of whatever the weather conditions are and if you've got scattered clouds the light's going to be changing on you every time the clouds pass over the sun um so i was looking for something that would give me more consistency within the look. And that's kind of where Joe McNally and the hot shoe diaries and, and uh, speed lights and high speed sync and all that kind of stuff started to, to seep into the, to the cortex there. Um, going back to your, your first question, you will not see me in any movies. There's a, there's a daytime soap opera, all my children yes. episode that if you oh. look really hard, you might find <laughs> Um, I was Hang very on. young. You probably, yeah, he's like, he's like, let me go get that. Um, you probably wouldn't even recognize me if you saw me. I mean, I weighed, you know, 140 pounds or something. I was like 22, you know, I was very clean shaven. I, I looked very young. Um, they were going to give me, they wanted to give me a recurring role, but I was, I was playing a 16 year old kid and they wanted me to play strip poker and I had, I had no problem taking my shirt off. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, but I got tattoos all over my back. So at that point, like, you know, I'm not 16 and <laughs> it would just, it didn't work out. And so um, that was probably the, the biggest thing I did. Funny enough though, once I had started, this is a funny side note. Um, once I had started my photography career, my wife and I bought a Tempur-Pedic mattress and right. about two months after the, the, we bought the mattress, we got an email and they're like, Hey, real Tempur-Pedic owner, would you like to be in a commercial? And so we ended up, <laughs> we ended up booking a, a national like Tempur-Pedic commercial that ultimately like paid for the mattress, which you can still find on the internet if you look hard. And since we do like surprises on this show, <laughs> what you'd be seeing next is said commercial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Temper Pedic. Here is that mattress. It, it, you know what? I, it, it's if you Google Temper Pedic, ask me, you'll probably find it. <laughs> He's like, look at him. He's like, I'm going to dig through that. Oh, this this will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> it, it cracked me up because it used to run all the time. So like I'd walk into the deli and the guys would be like, Hey, we just, we just saw you like two minutes ago. You know, how are you uh, here? And there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was funny. funny. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was probably the extent of, you know, I did a couple little like student things that you, you'll never find. They've probably never made it anywhere, but, um, yeah, I'm actually starting to get more into filmmaking and and I might do some acting here soon. I'm I've kind of been working with a creative collective, some of my clients and some of his friends and all got together during the pandemic and we're like, "Hey, we're sick of like not having content or, you know, jobs to shoot, so let's just make our own films." So I've been working then with them from the filmmaking cinematography side. And they're like, Hey man, you should like jump in front of the camera. You'd be a great bad guy. And I was like, great. That's so I've, I always knew I'd age into the role I wanted to play. You, so. you, you can do strip piker again, aren't you? You just, you just watch out for that one. I'll, I'll send it to you directly. I <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, like at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, we, um, when we first started mm -hmm. this, uh, this podcast, we actually set each other challenges. Um, so, you know, yeah. we had like a photo challenge one week and then, you know, had a video challenge another week and stuff like that, because, because we were like stuck in our houses and, you know, we, we just needed to do something creative. And so, you know, right. we started the podcast it was one thing and then we just, uh, we thought it'd be fun if we challenge each other to, you know, little challenges and things like, you know, Nick's background is in videography. Okay. And my awesome. background is, is in stills photography. So it was fun to challenge each other. You know, it was, and we, and of course we'd learn a lot along the sure. way, you know, so uh, make, you know, creating a, a video for a video challenge was really helpful for me because 
it's always good to have a little personal project and you know and you learn along the way um and totally. I think it's the same it's the same for nick yeah I guess. for sure um and so we uh you know so we we set each other challenges and then we got to the point where where um we would we would challenge our guests so <laughs> <laughs> so if you're up for a personal project, I'm not, okay. I'm not playing strip poker with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would like you to film strip poker as a scene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can figure. Hey, I'm always I'm always up for a challenge. All right, well, you got it. So we're gonna we're gonna think of a challenge at the end of this. Yeah, 100 percent done. Cool, All right. <laughs> wicked. Cool. Um, so when. So I want to come back to to you shooting um, headshots outside because again, mm. you know, we're over here in London. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, to the UK, but the I'm dying to go. You know, yeah. the weather here is terrible, like mm-hmm. terrible in the sense that it changes from one minute to the next. I mean, it's ridiculous. Literally, one of the biggest things for me moving to the UK was actually the fact that I could I could open my eyes in the morning, it'd be clear blue sky, I'd go to the bathroom, I come out two minutes later, and it's totally overcast, and it's like. <laughs> How did that just happen? <laughs> you know, and so you know and the problem that you have immediately if you want to shoot anything outside, it's the weather is totally unreliable. You can't yeah. rely on the weather forecast because they'll say it's like, you know, sunny and whatever, and then it's like raining all day or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes it's it's a little bit more reliable, but but generally speaking, it's it's, it's pretty bad. Problem with being an island yeah and it's windy you know and it's i mean it's not necessarily always really bad weather it's just unpredictable yeah sure you know so um so i've always found shooting out outdoors here a real challenge um it's stressful i would imagine mm. because it's not just it's not just the you know you have the wind and all kinds of stuff if you're photographing a female or long-haired male and winds blowing hair everywhere it it, um i'm not gonna lie it's not it's not easy anywhere. It, New York, probably similar, it, probably not as dramatic as London, I would think, but um, I would, I would put it in the same category. There were times in New York in the middle of the summer where it'd be pouring down rain, but you'd still see sun. So <laughs> it's like, um, it, it's, it's a challenge. So I think, you know, if, if the question that you're getting to is how do you do it there? Um, it's not going to be without its challenges. Um, it is possible to get the look inside. Um, I've done it for hotel clients. What you need is a lot of windows. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can, then you can kind of shoot against the windows. I've done that in a number of different locations where I've shot like inside hotel lobbies. And those are really, um, grand examples, you know, people aren't going to have access to that. And as you said, the same reason I never rented a studio in New York. It's like, I just didn't want to deal with the overhead of it. You know, I, the headshots were already kind of expensive in New York. Most of my clients were bartenders and waiters. And like, there's, there's this many people that can pay $2,000 or whatever for headshots. But then there's this whole other crop of people that that just can't afford to pay that. And um, it's not a, it's again, it's not a knock one way or the other. It was just my business focus was, you know, you should be able to pay for headshots with like two to four good shifts behind a bar waiting tables. And that was kind of where I priced things. So um, that meant that, you know, I could get a studio and, and, you know, ratchet people out back to back and, and just shoot four or five people a day, but that's exhausting. And I didn't want to do that. I, I, the most I really like to shoot is one or two people a day. Not even really two. Most of the time, I always just book one person a day. Yeah, um, it's enough for me. You know, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I totally. like connecting with that person for a couple hours, and then they leave, and then I've got the rest of the day. You know, yeah. like I totally, I totally agree. I mean, I changed, I changed the way I do things. I'm um, actually through like over the pandemic, I had a really good think about how I did things, and I completely yeah. radically changed it. Um, good. So now I'm really focusing on one person a day. And, yeah. you know, um, maximum really, and I don't put a time limit on it. So the yeah. whole thing just, um, uh, it's a lot more relaxed, you know, we can get to the really good shots, you know, yeah. uh, there's no pressure. Um, uh, I'm m- much more relaxed. The client is much more relaxed and actually yeah. the end result is so much better, you know? Yeah. Um, and everybody works different, but that's yeah. awesome that you did that because it's, it's, it goes back to that thing too, of like, 
you know, life is short. Like I want to enjoy my day and I don't mind. I like anybody that knows me knows I'm a workaholic. I mean, I, it's not that I can't shoot 15 people a day and I know I'm leaving money on the table by not doing, you know, a studio situation where I just, they come in the door and then they go out and, you know, um, but it's, I, you know, I, I can make more money. I, I tend to actually make um, most of my profit shooting hotels and stuff anyway. So headshots, when I, when I left New York, I was, I was very busy. I didn't know as many people in Los Angeles. So Mm -hmm. naturally things slowed down and I've had to kind of build it back up. And so it's, it's kind of at this point now where it's like, you know, there, I shoot when I want and, and when I'm busy doing other things, you know, people either wait or they don't, and it's it's fine. So, so this is actually um, something I was going to talk to you about because um, mm-hmm. because obviously moving from one place to another place quite far away, like from New York to LA, yeah. and uh, yeah, and obviously you can't really take your client base with you. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice, right? <laughs> but it's, it, that's a really high risk, and I'm wondering how you how how you cope with that because you i'm get in married a, you know i'm, I'm in, a, in a not too dissimilar <laughs> situation because in the long run you know uh like my half my family live in canada and uh, my wife's canadian too and so of course we often talk okay. about uh, moving to canada at some point in the future you know and sure. the first thing in my mind at the top of my mind is always like uh I've, you know what am i gonna do like i'm not gonna have a client base in Canada, <laughs> and, and, and yeah. no one lives in Canada. There are no people. <laughs> there's, there's a few in the mountains. Though. Yeah. It's like I've seen them. <laughs> uh, it's um, yeah. I mean, it's scary. It's mm. a real. It's a real fear. I mean, the things that you're feeling are 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 very real fears, and I felt them. I mean, it, you know, I've only recently probably we we moved to New York or we moved from New York to Los Angeles in uh, 2014. And it's only been within the last two to three years that I've felt kind of comfortable business-wise here. Right. Um, the first the first couple of years, I mean, I would have never been able to handle it, I don't think, without the fact that my wife, you know, we have two incomes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and my wife has supported me unequivocally throughout my entire photography career. I would not be a photographer um, if it wasn't for her. I mean, she... She pushed me to do it. She helped me with the financials. I was terrible with money when she first met me. Like I had like a 580 credit score when she first met me. So like (laughs) there's, there's been a lot of improvement just personally, you know, learning business. And so, um, but I think, I think the biggest problem most new photographers have, and, and it goes the same when you move is a lack of patience. You got to just stick it out, man. You got to just know that, that, you know, any good business takes 10 years to make. And once you move to a certain degree, some of that starts over again, but you've got a whole body of work that you can show when you move to that new location. So it doesn't take as long to reestablish yourself, but it does take time. And there's going to be, you know, I, I probably didn't use all of my time as wisely when I was, you know, slow when we first moved here. Um, but I was also enjoying, you know, elements of California. So it's, you know, take it as a chance to, to reinvent, reinvigorate, re, you know, rebrand, do, uh, you know, do all that stuff. Um, and it's certain, it's definitely possible wherever you want to go, you can make, you can make a business. You just have to do it and stick it out. And there's, I didn't pay for advertising. Like people get blown away. They they're like, you don't pay for any advertising. I was like, I've never paid for advertising. Hmm. I incentivize word of mouth through discounted rates when people, you know, drop their name when in a referral process. So like if I photograph one of you and uh, you go to your friend and say, Hey, mention my name and he'll give you, you know, 25 or 50 bucks off or whatever that makes everybody feel cool. Because yeah. now somebody gets to come to me and go, hey, you know, so-and-so sent me. And and I was like, oh, awesome. That gets you, you know, 25 bucks off. And then, you know, you concentrate on turning out a good experience and a good product for somebody by not having, you know, a bunch of limitations and, you know, being able to work casually and some of those changes that you've made. And uh, 
through through time, it'll just grow organically, you know. Um, but it just takes more time than some people, you know. So there's there's a lot of people that they want a gimmick, they want they want a, a keyword, they want a, a Google search, you know, solution or whatever it is. And it's just it's you don't if you're in London and you want to hire a plumber, do you? look in the on the internet and just grab one or do you talk to a few of your friends and are like hey who of you has used the plumber and who did you use did you like them and then you know that's kind of right. i feel like that's so much of who, how our industry is that it just never made sense to to pay for advertising at a certain point you get to you know your keywords will be good your google search will be good because you've been established in the area for a while so patience man patience is like everything i think in in this business you, so. you mentioned a couple of like really good things that you know people should be doing that anyone should be doing to start building a business. Yeah. But what what was the first thing you did when you got got out there to get yourself? Because obviously you're totally you know to a certain extent unknown out out in yeah. out in LA. Sure. What was the first thing you did to say, "Hey, I'm here. This is what I I've got." <laughs> I didn't do anything. Um, so I seriously Beach. like I there's I, Los Angeles has. A, you know, thousands of, of uh, headshot photographers. There's tons mm. of people out here. And at that point, the tutorial had just kind of come out shortly after we moved. And so there were people out here doing what I taught. Um, <laughs> in some cases for less than what I charge. So yeah. it's like, you know, I, and I've never been one to like, oh, well this, you know, I, I need to raise my rates or I need to price compete or I, you know, whatever. Um, I did kind of mess with my pricing a little bit at one point. I like, I kind of raised the rates high and then I, I brought them back down to where I just feel comfortable with them. Um, but in general, like I had a few people that I knew and I photographed them. Um, a couple of them paid, a couple of them didn't, a couple of them paid re really reduced rates. And I was like, Hey, you know, same thing, man. You got a friend, need some headshots, let them know, S give me, you know, tell them to mention you shoot me an email and, and we go from there. And, and literally it's same thing, man. It's mm -hmm. just took time, took yeah. a lot of time. Um, and it, it helped that I will say it helped that for whatever reason, the commercial side of my business, the, the hotel and architectural side, um, some of that started to kind of grow a little faster. And I, there's, I couldn't tell you why. I mean, there was, I had really good SEO for my hotel website. So I think that helped. And, uh, the company that I was working with, um, I'd started shooting a lot more Hilton's and Marriott's. And so my, my work was getting more refined. And so I think people were finding me, you know, there's a lot of referral in the hospitality world. People move around a lot, a lot of turnover. So, um, so that business started to kind of grow at a faster rate than it did in New York. So the first couple of years were slow and then some commercial business started to happen. The aviation thing started to happen. And, and so it, it kind of, it all worked out in the end, you know, you gotta just, I think, I think sometimes we worry about it too much. I think, you know, just, just exist in the space, be okay with being slow and, uh, and just focus on whatever work you do get being, you know, deliver those Ferraris, you know, don't, well, don't half-ass it. That's, so. that's the thing. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Ferraris because we, we ended, <laughs> we've, we've been shooting quite a lot of Ferraris. I saw that <laughs> actually. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's just, you know, that's actually something again, um, that is really a product um, of the pandemic. I don't right. think we would be doing this yeah. had it not been for the pandemic because yeah. we, um, you know, because we couldn't shoot people, um, in 20, like in 2019, sure. you know, uh, we literally one day just thought, you know, it'd be cool to shoot. Well, uh, well no, no, it was, it was, there's, there's a step further back on that. It's because oh. we started this podcast. Oh yeah, that's right. That is that right. we yeah, interviewed yeah, right. someone who did light painting. Yeah, correct. Um, da yeah. Uh, Dave Cox, wasn't it? And that was actually that's even funnier than that. We at the very very beginning when we first started the podcast, <laughs> you know, the reason why we started the podcast in the first place was because we spent all day talking about photography and like videography right. and that. You know, it's just because that's we like sure. to nerd out, and you know, my wife hates us for it and all that. You know, whatever. <laughs> um, but. You know, and, and there was this point where um, things were getting so 
intense over here was like the full on lockdown. Like, you know, we were like allowed outside the house for 45 minutes a day for exercise. And you know, I was like really super strict. Mm. And it got wow. to the point, like, you know, by the time I'd finished the Marvel movie marathon, I was like, I'm done. I'm done <laughs> with Netflix. Screw Disney Plus. I need to do something. And so, you know, and we were like, talk, we were on the phone and we're like, man, we got to do something creative. Man. We've got to do something. Like, I don't even know what day it is anymore, you know? <laughs> and literally, and, you know, and so, um, and so we started, you know, we decided to start a podcast and we gave us about three days to learn how to do it. Yeah. You know, and then we just got started. And so, uh, and in the very beginning, we, you know, in order to have something to talk about, we would look at like, you know, uh, different websites and get like photo news. And of course it was the pandemic. So people were doing interesting creative things in the, in the pandemic. Yeah. So we would talk about those kind of projects. And we come across this, this article um, about this guy called Dave Cox over in LA who uh, like went out at nighttime, all ninja style and started light painting cool cars by the roadside. Right. Oh, and he created that's... these like really freaking awesome um like images of cars, of really cool cars, you know, classic yeah. cars and like really cool cars. And so I got to up his work now. Yeah. And, you know, it got, it got picked up by, by Petapixel. Um, and, you know, it was a big article and it went kind of viral on, online. And, you know, so we picked it up and we talked about it anyway. And then a few weeks later, we decided to have guests on the show because we figured actually it'd be nice to have somebody else to talk to, right? And so... <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so here's how this, this whole thing comes together. So, so Nick basically went, "Oh, one of my former colleagues is a, a Formula One or like a rally rally photographer. So he'd be an interesting wow. guy to talk to." Yeah, and we're like, cool. "Okay, cool, cool." You know, so we so talked to him. Phone him up, did I, Dan? Yeah, just from, yeah, didn't come on the podcast. You know, you exactly. So, yeah, damn straight. So and yeah. so, you know, we started talking to him, and then you know, we like we're talking about this whole thing, and we're talking about cars, and then we mentioned the light painting thing. And he goes, oh, you know Dave Cox? Yeah, he's a friend of mine. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Really? <laughs> no way. And so anyway. So well, you... Oddly, it turns out that they used to do a podcast together. Yeah, well, that's even... <laughs> oh, wow. That's so, yeah. 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 So weird. The plot thickens. Uh, yeah. no, and so, so basically, eventually we got we got Dave on the show and, um, you know, we're talking to him about about light painting. And, and so, you know, and again, we were like in the midst of lockdown, we we're thinking like, man, we just it'd be fun to do something different, you know? We'll, we'll get into Ferrari sure. shortly, don't worry. Yeah. And, uh, and then we figured, you know, <laughs> okay. why don't we, seeing that we can't shoot any humans, why don't we shoot cars? You know, and... Um, and they are you know, still so, sexy. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. And so, you know, and so we started like, you know, we learned how to light paint and, um, and then, you know, and I, and so, yeah, we shot a lot of cars and then we got to the point where um, I, I just, I love doing... Uh, environmental portraits so that's it's just the thing that i really love doing is i like um yeah. creating sets and i like filling with stuff and putting people into funny body positions and all that kind of stuff so yeah. um and then and you know and, and so now where we are now is that we're shooting uh, cool cars with people in it oh cool, <laughs> Very so, cool. Yeah. but again it's just like a fun thing um that's that is literally a product of the of the pandemic and completely and it's you know it's definitely something we'll definitely continue doing because it's so much yeah. fun to do actually. This, you know. uh, I'm I'm glad you guys you know seize the opportunity. Like I said, I I you know looked at a at a bunch of people that were doing cool stuff. And I was like, hey, I should go do that. And then I was like, I didn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I think it's great, man. I you know what you got to do. I so a, a number of and I'll I'll only touch on this really briefly, but in like twenty. 17 i was in a motorcycle accident shattered my right leg and it was like one of those like not your average broken leg like you know pretty pretty gnarly and um you know it's cliche but life really is too short you know and and a pandemic i think really kind of highlighted that for a lot of people who are stuck in this rat race because there's also a lot of people who had never really created much of anything mm -hmm. who started creating things or left their jobs or, you know, so um, you guys found a place to be inspired. And, and, you know, the same thing with, with your podcast, it's the longer you do it, the more successful it's going to be. You just yeah. have to keep doing it. You know, yeah. this, this, there's a number of things there. I mean, one is, you know, in, in a situation like the pandemic, I think, you know, it's everybody, like people deal with that whole scenario in different ways. You know, some people take it as, as an opportunity to just literally wind down, relax, 
maybe kind of look inside of themselves and and uh, take stock and and maybe come to some decisions that might maybe life changing decisions. Yeah. Post pandemic and stuff, whether that's business wise or career wise, I know a lot of people have basically all of a sudden realized that I don't like what I'm doing. I just don't. I want <laughs> yeah. to change. I just I can't do this anymore. You know. Can you imagine that after 10 years? You've been like grinding away at an office and then a pandemic happens and you're like, I don't well, want to yeah. do this anymore. Just, <laughs> it's just like, what? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, liberating, but also, wow. You know, I know. Yeah. I've, recently, I've recently heard of a friend of mine who's, who's getting divorced because of that. Really? Because yeah. of the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> just basically, well, man, that's it. I've there is it. There's a stand-up comedy bit in there somewhere. <laughs> For sure. yeah, yeah. Well, if, it, if it's, if it's it going to happen pandemic. over that, it's, it's going to happen yeah. at some point in the future. Well, but the same thing. It, that's what pretty much happened to me. You know, when I left that, I, I, I used to when I worked for I used to work for Amazon, and uh, I took a three month sabbatical. Yeah. And mm. to try and de-stress and just get you know forget about work, forget about anything, just relax, right and. Uh, oh, I, I got back and pretty much handed in my notice. <laughs> Good. Good for you. you know, 15 years down the line. Turns yeah. out I hated the job. <laughs> Turns no out I hated working there. <laughs> yeah. I, no, it didn't always, but I just got to that point where I, enough was enough and said, right, I, yeah. I need to be self-employed. I need to work for myself. I need to freelance and do what I enjoy. And that's across the And how do you and, like being self-employed? It's stressful in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're all basically in control of it and yeah. I can stress about it as much as I want or as little as I want. I can do something about it or I can not do something about it. Yeah. It's up to me. So yeah. it, it took a little bit of getting used to, you yeah. know, going from effectively being told what you need to do or what you should be doing or what you need to work towards to suddenly being, having to be a self starter and being right. disciplined. And that, took a long time it didn't help that i i took about 18 months off then anything <laughs> at all because i was so my head was so messed up from working there for so long that i just needed to totally cool cool down yeah and so then that then had its had a, a negative effect that it then took me a long time to get going again and to really start moving sure. um, but it, it happened uh, it happened yeah. and and that was that then i started getting involved with other people in similar worlds and there we go. Things move from there. That's amazing. That's amazing. Good for you, man. That's I was awesome. pretty pleased with myself. As you should be. As you should. Be. It's it's a scary thing, you know. A lot of Terrifying. a lot of people take working for somebody else for granted. And I mean, there's times to this day, man. I you can ask my wife. Like in the middle of the after the accident, in the middle of the pandemic, I'm just like maybe maybe I should go do something else. Like you know, it'd be really nice to just get a paycheck. Yeah. Just like mm. punch the ticket and, you know, say goodbye at the end of the day and, and not think about anything else after that. Um, yeah. But I, you know, ultimately I, I don't, there's, there's not a lot of people I think that are geared to working for other people. It's, it's something we have to do, but there's a lot of people who want to start their own thing and, and don't know how, or, or, uh, you know, whatever. So I, I love hearing stories that the pandemic, you know, made somebody start a new business of whatever it is, you know, so it's, it's good. Something to be proud of for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, totally exclusive. Like, I mean, you, you know, you can have, uh, you can you can be in employment and start a business on the side, like you know. Totally, it's, totally. Yeah, I mean, that's especially the wisest, that's the wisest way to yeah. do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? I mean, especially yeah. with some creative, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing you know, thing for me is really, you know, um, I've kind of fallen into photography by accident almost, you know, because um, although there's there's actually I'm the third generation photographer in my in my family, really. So it's not sure. like it's a new thing, but. Um, you know, I studied music and I was a session musician for 25 years and that's, that's what I did. And, um, wow. and, uh, and then, and then it was only, it's it actually only when my dad passed away about, or, you know, about seven, eight years ago, maybe, um, okay. that my mom said that, you know, I, I kind of said like, you know, I need to do, I need to have something. Cause I'm like, I, 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 play music all day i teach music when i'm not playing i need something 
to take my mind off of things. I need to do something else and I need to do something creative. That's just how I am, you know? So yeah. um, building furniture wasn't going to do it for me, I guess. <laughs> well, because I'm not that way inclined, you know? Sure. But, <laughs> but, you know, so, so, uh, so my mom actually said to me, you know, like uh, what, what about, like you love creative things. You love, you love visual things. You like, you like visual arts. Like, and I've always shot videos when I was a kid. I've always had, like, I've always made photos and played with Photoshop and all the kind of, I've always created things. Sure. And she goes like, well, how about get yourself a cool, like a nice camera and, you know, do something with that. And I kind of thought, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> um, and that was that was the that was literally the beginning of the end because um, once I had that thing in my hand, that was game over for me. I was like, I was hooked. That's so, what. You know. See, that's amazing. I mean, it, you know, that's it's good that you you seize that moment. You know, um, but the funniest thing that the I mean, I, I remember that moment. The very first time somebody said to me, "Hey, can you make this photo for me?" And I'm going to pay you for it. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, yeah. well, actual money. <laughs> Like yeah. not monopoly money, but actual money. Like what? Yeah. It's, a, it's a damn good feeling the first time you get paid. It's an, am for it's an amazing months, right? feeling. It's okay, also, so so the first time you get paid, you got paid, both of you. What did you guys do with it? Um, well, I felt like a fraud. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it back. Take it back. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, this I guy doesn't really even know. I know. <laughs> it was on auto all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know? I think I. Well, it would have been for audio work. I, oh God, what would it have been? What would I bought it? I, I, I think I bought a new bit of gear, or some new plugin, or I, something I, like that with it. I bought a Nifty Fifty One Point Eight. Oh, nice. Okay. Because yeah. I awesome. figured, let's do that. <laughs> You know. Plastic one, no, yeah, and I still use it for a lot of use it for lots of products. Yeah, yeah. I'm straight. No, yeah, it's a it's an amazing feeling. I literally was reminiscing about that the other day. I got like a I don't know a check from a, a client, and I was like, I I looked at my wife. I was like, Hey, you remember like the first time I wrote us a check for five hundred dollars from my business account? You know, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. It's, uh, it's it's an amazing feeling, and. But yeah, there's there's a lot of stress. I got way more gray hair in the last mm. four years than I <laughs> care to admit. And, yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's all character, right? It's wisdom. I think I actually get paid more now because I have more gray hair. Well, <laughs> right? That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah. yeah. Like, my millions are coming shortly. Then yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'm creeping. <laughs> it's, it's not gray. It's silver. Oh, yeah. The color of wisdom. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's it. Distinguished. Well, I like it. I like it. Exactly. Distinguished. Yeah. <laughs> that's, absolutely. There's no hiding it. I, you know, you get to embrace it. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with gray. Yeah. I'm like, losing my hair. I have an issue with, but gray, I'm, I'm all over that. No problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll take the gray over, over no hair. Yeah. Oh yeah, so. for sure. Plus my wife says she likes it. So it's, um, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. At the end of the day, happy wife, happy life. You're growing hair where you don't want it. No, no. Oh, yeah. No, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it's but always have... fun when you're like, what is that in what my What the ear? hell is and that? And then you're like, oh <laughs> yeah. my God, how if long can, has that been in there? If you can grab a nose hair, they're too long. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. bought, I tell you what, I bought a beard trimmer, like a new beard trimmer the other day. And it's, it's like, it's this set, you know, it has like lots of different attachments, right? Yeah. And that's this one thing I'm thinking like, what is this thing? And I'm, I'm looking through the instructions, like it's a nose hair trimmer. So you stick this thing up your yeah. nose and... I've never seen anything like that before. Where have you been? Terrifying. Well, I've never had to like trim my nose hair. <laughs> <laughs> what don't, the hell is this? Don't song? worry, <laughs> the time is coming yeah. soon. <laughs> uh, but the other thing I've noticed is that you know when you have like, what? How is it that when you shave, like when you trim your beard, right, with a beard trimmer, how is it that that it trims all the regular hairs, but but it, the gray hair seems to they seem to like escape somehow? What is the deal with that? Uh, I can only guess that they're lighter. And if if you were to, if you uh, right, okay, we're cards on the table. I do put. I, <laughs> <laughs> I might cut this. We'll see. <laughs> this is the fun part. But you know, I, I do pull out the old. I said, "What the hell is that?" There's a couple of greys there. Pull it, and they don't require any pulling. Oh, really? They just come out instantly. Whereas a regular hair, you <sighs> you have to tug on that bad boy to, no for it to come out. Yeah. 
And so I'm wondering, they're light, maybe they're lighter, less dense, whatever yeah, it might be. Something's different. They just, they just escape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something's different. It's weird. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, we'll cut this. Another. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. We got another 747 coming over. Yeah, here. well. It's a nice kind of uh, low rumble, you know. It's like one of those sound therapies, like white noise. <laughs> yeah. <You're> gonna, you know. <laughs> mm. yeah, there like, was a there was a thing though during the like during the actual lockdown. Originally, there were like no planes in the sky. Nope. That was weird. it. Was amazing. I bet that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's because I live. Um, in, there was like, no traffic area. in Los Angeles. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Like I live in a suburban area um, of London and uh, of Greater London, and the um, and we live very close to the M25, which is like the big ring motorway um, okay. highway around London. Sure. Um, and usually, depending on which direction the wind is blowing, you can hear it quite clearly. Okay. And of course, then we're also uh, like under one of the flight paths to Heathrow, so you can normally you you know this is it's a busy sky. Um, but during the pandemic, man, there was nothing. Yeah, that's no amazing. Noise. And I remember, yeah. like, I remember sitting in the garden one time, and like in my backyard, I'm thinking, I can hear birds. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> that's <laughs> e- weird. <laughs> I know. Even when that's planes st- planes did to start kicking up around here again, mm. I still didn't get them. So I live in Windsor. Uh, well, I live in Eton, but Windsor. Which, so we've got Windsor Castle, and the Queen stayed okay. in Windsor during the pandemic. So you she can lived literally, here. You can literally oh, see wow. that. No more. You less. can. But what they do when the Queen's in residence here is they divert planes. Oh, yeah. They take a different oh, route nice. so they don't go over the castle. That's handy. Yeah. <laughs> it's spectacular. You're like, the Queen's coming. It's going to be quiet for the next week. <laughs> yeah, week, yeah. You know? Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Mm. Cool. Well, actually, talking about planes now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like we planned that segue. <laughs> Absolutely. See, that's what a 60 episodes do to you. <laughs> Just, you know, instinct. Um, yeah, so talking about planes, um, the one thing I was really surprised to see on your website is your aviation mm. photography. Um, Thank you. And it's, how did you, how did you fall into that? Like, how did you get to um, get into aviation? So it, it, I, I honestly couldn't even tell you to this day. Um, it, it had a lot to do with just, um, my architectural hotel work and my headshot work. So it was a combination of the two things. Um, basically this company and all of that work, and I should kind of preface this as like, anytime you're trying to sell things, you go to my website, I'm, I'm trying to sell my services as an aviation photographer or a hotel photographer. Um, I've done several jobs, aviation related, all of them for the same company. You know, I, I feel like, an aviation photographer is somebody doing a lot more than I'm doing with it, but you got to start somewhere. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you can't be afraid to go, Hey, I've got a body of work. I can do this now. Um, And so basically what happened was this company, which is probably like, I think they're like the sixth largest private jet charter company in the world or something. Um, And they're based over here in Van Nuys. And he calls me up and he goes, Hey, you know, we're with uh, this company, Clay Lacey Aviation, and and you know we saw we we like you to come out. We need some photography done. We want to talk to you and kind of get a sense of of what you can do for us. And and obviously, I was intrigued. I grew up. My grandfather was a pilot. I grew up flying in his little Cessna and terrifying my grandmother. And so I was just like, <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. I'll do it for free. I don't care. Um, and so not really, I didn't say that because <laughs> I knew they, <laughs> yeah, I looked at their website <laughs> and um, I was like, well, okay, you know, let's, let's talk. You know, they kind of mentioned that they would need some architectural stuff and they would need some headshot stuff. And, and he goes, look, you're, you're, I'm not worried about your headshot stuff. We need that. It's great. It's exactly what we're looking for. Um, side note, a lot of my corporate clients tend to like some of the, the more cinematic look because it's, um, has more of a lifestyle feel to them. It's a little mm-hmm. brighter. It's a little more commercial. Um, it's also harder to replicate. So, you know, if you, if you've got a company and everybody's shot against a gray background, it's a lot easier for another photographer to replicate that than not. So selling point there for just the style in general, it's a way to sell it to your clients and, and have them keep coming back. Um, but 
So he's like, I'm not worried about that. I've seen your architectural stuff. We've got these new facilities that we're renovating. I'm not even really worried about that. He's like, what I don't see in your work is what we need a lot of, which is kind of just, um, I would, I would term it like aviation lifestyle photography, maybe mm -hmm. just like shots of them marshalling planes and bringing planes in and, and, uh, you know, some of that kind of stuff. And I was like, listen, um, I'll come out, we'll do a walk through the facilities. I'll talk to you. We'll, we'll have a dialogue about it and, um, take it from there. And so I went out there, did a walk through, got a sense of what they were looking for. And, uh, it was going to be like a two or a three day shoot. And, uh, I said, look, I'll come out there for three days. I'll shoot all this stuff for you. Um, if you find nothing you like, then you don't have to pay me. You can't use the images, but you don't have to pay me. Um, we'll just, we'll just part ways right there. I was like, but if you find something you like, then it's, you know, it's game on. Um, and they were like, great, perfect. So it kind of, you know, it showed that I was willing to, you know, kind of go toe to toe with them. It's like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, from a business standpoint, it's like, I could have said, well, there's a day rate involved. I don't care if you like anything or not, but that probably wouldn't have landed me the job. So, um, so I went out there. We shot for three days. They immediately already just right off the back of the camera were finding things that they liked. And so from then on, it was it was kind of, you know, downhill from there. Um, I got to have some fun and do things a little differently than they were used to. So um, shooting jet charter is a very complex logistical operation for them. They've got to know, you know, they they want certain planes there. You know, they don't want to necessarily shoot a lot of small cabin planes, even though they have that. And, you know, they want the big, you know, Gulfstream G4s mm -hmm. and stuff like that and some smaller planes, but they want the nice ones, you know, stuff, stuff like that. So um, it was a lot of planning, a lot of logistical stuff, but it was also like a lot of fun. Some of the uh, shots that I did inside the plane, um, they allowed me to kind of play with motion too. They wanted, they, they were like, you know, we, a lot of, a lot of their type of photography is like models and they're perfectly posed in the plane, looking out, drinking the wine. And they, they wanted more of their employees and more energy within the frame. And so they, they allowed me to kind of bring an architectural concept in, which is, you know, kind of dragging the shutter for some of that soft motion in the person. So it's not always necessarily about the person. It's just about, you know, the life and the photo is as that. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, where that's that, that, you know, look within that, within those shots came from. Um, we ended up backing this Gulf stream into a hangar and uh, myself and my assistant put 3000 watt tungsten lights outside of the plane, shooting into the cabin of the plane to kind of simulate. <laughs> I wanted it to look like it was up in the air. Um, most of their other cabin photography is very sterile, kind of what I would equate to like real estate. You know, they're, they're selling the plane. This is the plane you get for this much. And so I wanted these to be a little moodier. Um, so we mixed in some tungsten hot lights and some flash, you know, some daylight and, uh, you know, dragged the shutter a little bit and, and, you know, had some fun with it. And then I had a bunch of, uh, uh, sky shots, you know, cause if you're shooting architecture, you probably have your own sky library where you just shoot a bunch of yeah. skies. And, and I had shot a bunch of stuff up on top of Haleakala on the Island of Maui in Hawaii. And that's 10,000 or so feet up. And so the clouds look, the perspective is right. And so a bunch of the clouds that you see in some of those in the skies are all from the top of, uh, you know, <laughs> Hawaii to make it look like it was up in the air. Um, so it was fun and it was challenging. I think, um, I get part of part of what I find joy in is solving problems, mm -hmm. right? So I think photography, filmmaking, and that's kind of my pull towards filmmaking too, is is solving lighting problems, solving look, you know, how do we how do we take what we have and make it look the way we want to look? It's mm -hmm. to me, sometimes it's less, it's less the art as it is the challenge of getting from A to B, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and obviously there's an artistic element in there, but it comes from solving problems. And, and, uh, I think a good photo, any good photographer has got to be a good problem solver. And, and so when I love shooting things that, 
I've never done before. So like you were saying in the, in the pandemic, you were shooting these large logistical warehouses. It was, it's so crazy. You mentioned that because I literally just did a job for a client who's in that industry and earlier last year in the pandemic, same client, they were like, Hey, we've got like eight of these warehouses we want you to shoot. And it's like, okay, how do I make these bratty old warehouses look sexy? Yeah, exactly. You know? And uh, so it's the challenge of it. That's yeah. exciting. And I found um, that, that was exactly the challenge that I loved about it because, um, you know, they're just big blue boxes, basically. You know, it's yeah. like, how do you make a shoe box look interesting? Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. And that was, the, that was the challenge. But I think, you know, for me, um, I actually found the whole experience really quite um, kind of inspiring because I, I just, I love being in these big spaces. And the, the thing is, um, you know, my client, uh, they built these things. And so when, when I go to photograph them, um, they're virtually empty. They've just at the, at the point of handover to the actual, you know, Tenant. company that will stock them. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I'm there, um, they've got all the, the metal girders are in, you know, for their like automated shelving systems, but there's no products in there. So the whole thing is, you know, they're huge and they're That's empty. Amazing. And I remember shooting this um, this one place, which is the biggest distribution center for a very well-known German supermarket chain that starts with an L. Can't mention the name, but there you go. Um, gotcha. And um, and it's the biggest um, distribution center in the whole of the UK, or maybe in Europe wow. or something. It was insane. It was I think it was like the size of like you could you could like put two seven four sevens inside or something like that. It was crazy. Wow. That's not possible. They're all above my house. <laughs> no, yeah. But in, in terms of size, but you know, the thing yeah. this, I remember being in there, and I remember like just standing in this indoor space that was so huge that it almost like had its own microclimate in there, you know. And um, and I remember there was, there was a guy. It was me in there, and at the other end of this of this building was a guy hitting some like some metal girders or something with like a sledgehammer. And every time he hit it, I could hear the the echo, and it was just like he just went whang, and he just went. Wah, 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 wah. 15 second tail yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I, the only thing i kept i kept thinking like i should have brought my longboard in here man that would have been so cool uh, you right. know <laughs> and that's what i did i mean I, you know there, there were there were times when i had a skateboard because i had to get round you know i had to do um mm -hmm. kind of exterior sh uh, shots and like interior shots and just to get around the place because of the distances involved it would yeah. just make more sense for me to skate around it than um than to walk really? because it would, would have taken forever to walk you know, yeah. so, uh, it's a, they're amazing structures. Yeah. Uh, you know, millions of square feet. Yeah. Um, it's, it's incredible. So and here's a question for you both then, which, you know, people listening, I'm sure have already asked themselves as, as you guys were talking about, talking about that is how then do you make these massive, massive buildings look sexy? What, what, what goes through your mind when you're looking at these? Cause they all look the same. So how do you yeah, then true. kind of distinguish one from, from another? You know, what, what kind of goes through your mind it's, while you're there? I, I mean, for me, it's, it's really just finding interesting angles. You mm -hmm. know, it's all about angles and perspective with these things. It's, you know, um, it's, you, you know, you shoot, when you shoot a huge building from literally from lying on the ground, you get a completely different perspective on the thing than if mm -hmm. you're like, if you're exactly. higher up. So, you know, I remember like there was a, a one time I was on a crane shooting down, um, and getting sort of part of the, which would have been like the office part of it, I guess, you know, uh, but it was almost like a bird's eye perspective, but I was on top of this stupid crane shooting down. So it yeah. almost looked like a drone shot, but it was actually on, okay. on this crane. That's cool. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just finding, finding interesting angles and picking out interesting details um, because, you know, for the most part, um, it's all industrial. So there's like cool designs. Like even flipping doors look cool in there because they're yeah. just, mm, mm. they have these kind of, you know, interesting like uh, Probably designs. Probably a lot of and, symmetry too. Yeah, and symmetry. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot yeah. of symmetry in there. Um, symmetry. Our brains love symmetry. Yeah. I mean, I, it doesn't matter if you're an architectural photographer or not. I mean, I, you know, much of that is, is the compositions I'm sure you chose. My, most of the places I shot weren't empty. So I actually kind of right. envy you because they were like, they were like, we want everything to look as full as possible. Right, right. And in right, my right. head, I'm going, I want the whole place to be empty with just the racks, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. But yeah. I get it, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, I'm I'm super jealous. And these are like, 
these were buildings that were like old and constrained, you know? So, right. um, and, and look, I got shots that look better than what they were probably intending. Um, my, your shots of new, new buildings with, you know, empty racks. And I, I'm sure are much sexier. Um, and from a challenge, I guess my, my, uh, the component of my job was probably slightly different in that they wanted more of the office stuff done. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Part of what made that sexy was we staged it and we added color and we, you know, I had them bring in tables and donuts and pastries and coffee and <laughs> things to kind of add life to the space. Um, and the actual warehouse shots, it was like, you know, we need two or three. And so I would try and find an area where I could get as much visual out to see the, the entirety of the space. And then um, enough boxes and kind of some sort of cool configuration to let you believe it was full. And then I always tried to find, cause they were active warehouses. Um, I was always adding in like a, you know, a blurry forklift or, um, you know, something like that to kind of add a little human scale or people walking or, you know, something like that. Um, but I would have much preferred to be in your shoes and, and have it be empty <laughs> and nice and new and yeah, pretty. The, the thing about that is that you can really play with color there as well. Cause the colors are so yeah. basic, you know, you've got, there's a lot of gray yeah. and, uh, and then you've got a lot of uh, bright orange or bright yellows because all of the, you know, the shelving when it's brand mm -hmm. new, they've got these like signal colors on them. Yeah. So, you know, you can come, you can come up with some really cool um, compositions that way where you like, you play, you know, you place, um, so sort of high, high, highly, like some, some metal girder that's been painted with some high vis paint or something against some great yeah. background or whatever. So it's, you know, it's, it, you come up with some really interesting images that look in a sense, look nothing like a warehouse in a weird way, um, yeah. but are totally different from anything that they would have ever had before in terms of photography in there. And so yeah. I think that was kind of the, that was the, uh, that was kind of the fun part. Shooting the lab was different in a sense because, um, yeah, what there were was time, that? Um, there were time. Well, it's difficult because they were um, basically um, the handover was supposed to be that uh, that day at midnight, and when I rocked up uh, about midday that day, um, the whole thing looked like a bomb had gone off in there. I mean, it was there was like there was wow. debris on the floor. It was just it was like. It was terrible. And I just thought, photographer's nightmare. Yeah. And I immediately thought, <laughs> man, I can't shoot anything here. It's like, this is like, you've got all the construction dirt still on here, all the kind of trash everywhere. It's like, what am I going to shoot to make this look good? This is like, and you know, I've got literally until midnight. And you know, wow. I, I, I kept, I kept talking to the, um, to the, the manager and I'm like, are you really handing this over in like eight hours from now or in like 10 hours from now? And he goes like, yeah, it will be absolutely perfect in 10 hours i'm like i can't see it happening <laughs> and then what they did yeah and you know and what what they did was um they basically went through it room by room so there were several labs i can't i can't remember like maybe six or seven labs um and then you know there were like cool storage rooms like refrigeration rooms and then there were like obviously office um office rooms and whatever um and then it was like this this high um this like super high tech, almost like James Bond meets Star Trek uh, type of entrance area where everybody had to like s s I don't know do retina scans and I don't know <laughs> s scan their ball sack or something. I have no idea. It was just it was like it's crazy. Um, wow. But what they did was basically they went through the whole building, literally room by room. They had like this this team of people like locusts. They would just descend on this one room and just blitz that one room, and then oh, it'd be wow. me shooting in there. And then they would move on to the next room and they would blitz that room. And I tell you, it was incredible. But when I, by the time I left there, which was about 11 p.m. or something, the whole place was ready. And I would have never thought it was going to happen. It was just, you know. That's incredible. They just threw everything yeah. in, the, in the kitchen sink at that. <laughs> this is nuts. Yeah, you know, you say that. And like, initially, I was like, yeah, no, of course you want it looking spotless. And I would look mm -hmm. at, you know, I would want it looking that way too. I wonder though, if there was an opportunity there for like 
the disastrous lap. Look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would like, be so much fun. <laughs> like, can you let me in for just one shot and let me yeah. get like you know? That would have been like just, been just very great for the press. Can you imagine? Yeah. Like, yeah, this is what from they an want environmental to... standpoint, you know, like get a doctor. Oh, yeah. And like stick him in there in the yeah. lab, and he's just like, you know, yeah, yeah. hair's all messed <laughs> up, and like with a little like with a petri dish or something with some like green slime in there or something, yeah, or smoke. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. It, it, it'll just be one of those UK government captions over the top. <laughs> oh my god. Like, yeah. I'm going those to test all... for COVID. I just don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only oh. think of those things after I've left and I'm like, Oh no, it's perfect. Everything's yeah, yeah. straight and everything's clean and the way yeah. it should be. And, you know, and then we I'm talking like, about this um, a couple of weeks ago when we, we did this, um, we shot this Ferrari um, and it was, it was like an environmental kind of portrait. And the, the original idea was we, we had this workshop and the original idea was that we would shoot this car uh, and it was supposed to be this like really clean looking, like luxurious looking mm -hmm. kind of thing. And, you know, with the owner of the car all being dressed, uh, dressed up nicely, you know, um, yeah. and lit well and, you know, to, to give, slippers on, yeah, well, to give off this, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, to give off this, like the sense, the sense of like clean lines and like a luxurious kind of almost like dramatic kind of, kind of look. And then when sure. we, and so, you know, we said this last time, but, um, they sent us some photos of the location, um, and we didn't have time to actually go and see the the actual location ourselves and so the the images that we got were like clean walls you know clean floor clean ceiling so so that was the kind of idea the concept that we came up with but then when we actually rocked up we realized that what they hadn't shown us was one whole side of this workshop which was basically crammed with like dusty dirty tools and like yeah. uh work benches and all kind cool of stuff. stuff yeah and we <laughs> wow. you know and and some like super old uh dirty overall thing and like we just, I, I saw this and I just went, right, we're going to change a few things around here, yeah. you know? And so the whole thing turned into like, why don't we juxtaposition this, this luxury car with yeah. this dirty, gritty workshop yeah. feel type of yeah. a thing, you know, and just go all out on that. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's way cooler than a clean room, man. Yeah, exactly. Way right, right. Yeah. That's so cool. So all of that, like all of that dirty, you know, all of the like the tools and the, the workbench and stuff, that was all like hidden in like on one side of the workshop. Um, yeah. So that's amazing. The, see, the interesting thing there was actually because um, you you were talking earlier about uh, balancing um, tungsten lights with flash, and you know, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what we what we had to do in in this particular shot because the uh, well for two well actually mainly for one reason it was because I only I only brought one strobe. Because my original idea was going to be a simple one light setup, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, but you know, I mean, typically, I I would I would have normally packed um, you know a couple of straws at least, but but it, it, for some reason I didn't. So, um, so we we had to balance the the strobe off with um with like a constant light that we mm -hmm. had on the on the car because I wanted to just put a light on the back of the car, like on the on the engine bit, just to give us give it a little bit more detail, just a tiny little sure. bit. And so that was interesting. It was interesting balancing that off. It's not really something I do very often, yeah. Typically, but paid off. It paid off. Yeah, definitely. it really paid off. It, it made all the difference that that no. night. I've actually had you know people within headshot photography ask me why um, I don't correct for you know because um, a lot of times like some of the bluer backgrounds I get are shooting into the shade on a sunny day or. Mm. Um, they're like, why don't, you know, why don't you correct the blue cast that ends up in their hair or whatever? And I'm just like, you know, why? I don't, I think some people are like really afraid of color contrast, mm -hmm. but people mix color temperatures all the time. It makes yeah. things more interesting. I have no hesitation to, to walk in and shoot a tungsten room with a daylight strobe if I think it's going to look cool you know like i don't i don't care if it's splashing on their shoulders or whatever like that's you know um as long as it's not distracting so i yeah, yeah mix mix it up put them all in there yeah. fluorescent <laughs> whatever 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's all you know. The thing is, like, it's you know, as you said earlier, it's, it's always a matter of, of problem solving. You know, we had mm -hmm. the problem that we had was was that we wanted to get more light onto the back of the car uh, because just with the with the single strobe, it just ended up too dark, and I just wanted. Right. I just wanted to lift it. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want it to jump out or anything. I just wanted to lift it up a little bit so that the shadows yeah. weren't totally blocked out um, on that. Well, but it feels it edges the car out too. It gives the car some dimension. I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. I just took another look at it and it gives it that, uh, you know, it feels more naturally lit. If yeah, there, you know, because there would not be just one source of light in that room. There would be exactly. several. So mm -hmm. um, I think it, I think it worked out, man. I think he's. You guys killed it. It looks awesome. Yeah, it was funny. It was it's also funny getting it was funny getting the owner into that overall. There are some interesting um versions of that photo, let's say. <laughs> um in oh, all yeah? sorts of uh <laughs> Go on, put well, your yeah. out, but he's, he looks more like a bird. Yeah, we went we yeah. went for some comedy there as well at some <laughs> yeah. point for sure. Yeah, you gotta Sorry, you gotta have a few of those, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that was that was good fun. Um but you know, as always, it sort of you know creatively. I think it just leads to you know to other ideas. I mean, uh, with this with this particular um, shoot, um, I think in the end it felt much more like what I actually like to shoot, which is is these sort of elaborate um, you know environmental portraits where there's a lot of clutter in the background. There's a lot of it's very you know the kind of the busy set type of detail sort of stuff. But we we said yeah. this a couple of weeks ago that. Mm. You can't be afraid to change what you want to do when you arrive, when you really see the situation. Sure. Go in with a game plan so you're not yeah. totally blind and you, you know you've got you know what you, you're gonna go in doing. But if there's something else that changes when you're there, or there's another oh god, that's gonna be a better photo. That's yeah. gonna be worth more effort doing that than go with it. Yeah. Go with it. Well, and having the you know, having the not not just that, but having the confidence to tell the client this is what we're doing because it's going to be better <laughs> right yeah and and it's going to be completely different than what you told me you wanted but this is going to look better you know there's there's um i talk a lot with headshot clients about working with confidence and it's a you know it's a big it's something that i pulled from acting school and um it applies to everything in life because people you know if you're not working with confidence there's there's a shaky thing that people don't trust you know the right. confidence is what's sexy confidence is what sells and and it's not that arrogant confidence it's just grounded in who you are and what you can accomplish mm -hmm. confidence and if you you know even if you have doubt you go no we can you know i'm going to do this and this is going to look great so yeah. the fact that you went with it and convinced the client to to do it um should be commended too, because well, the thing is, you know, you know, the reality I think with this particular shoot was it, you know, we were lucky in the sense that it was almost like a test shoot, you know, sure. um, like it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't like we'd sort of, uh, you know, hashed out a precise concept with the client sure. beforehand. I mean, they, uh, he had an idea as to what we were gonna shoot, yeah. and obviously, it kind of sort of signed off on that. But, um, you know. I think there was always this sort of flexibility to say like, okay, well, things may turn out different sure. depending on how the land lies when we actually get there. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, especially when you really, you know, when all you've seen of the location is a bunch of um, iPhone photos beforehand. You know, right, right. It's, that was just so, always that. Sometimes I feel like most of the planning I do with clients is for them. <laughs> like sure, yeah. it's just yeah. just to make them feel better about what we're going to do yeah. because ultimately things always change on a shoot. And so if, you know, it's again, being able to, you know, have that plan, like you said, and, and be able to roll with it and, and not be afraid to try something different. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to have a plan, but it should, I, you know, there's, I think sometimes people are like, okay, I have to, I have to map all this out and we have to go from A to B and they're, you know, that's it. And, and I think that, um, could be good for some people. Um, it's not how I roll, clearly not yeah. how you guys roll. Um, and some, you know, some clients may want that, you know, I, there's probably a lot of high, I don't do a ton of, uh, you know, I know there's photographers that do like a ton of really high budget key art shoots that shoot for like, you know, a television campaign or whatever, and things have to be very dialed in to a certain extent. Um, but I've also heard stories from some of them were like, yeah, you know, we, um, we showed up to shoot this person at, at uh, you know, uh, Penn Station, 
And in, we had this great location and there was lots of light and it was nice. And then they were like, no, I want to be shot down in the, in the train station itself. Yeah. Well, now everything changes. So, um, I think it can work both ways, certainly. Yeah. So, we, you know, being able to solve those problems and be, uh, in, be have that improvisational mindset. Yeah. I personally think I'm more creative and work better when I'm just kind of throwing shit against the wall to see what sticks than, <laughs> than having a, a real formulated plan. Sometimes I really see things and I'm like, I want it this way. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's always some variation, some little something that that, you know, messes with that a little bit even if it's just a little bit so this um there's a gregory crutzen thing i i saw recently um oh my god i love gregory crutzen oh man he's he's freaking insane but you know what the thing that really struck me the most was um i saw this thing what is it called it's you know it's 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 this photo where it is it's like a it's a road going off into the distance and there's a car and it's like a traffic light do you know what i mean mm-hmm. um well uh, i mean this, he's got a bunch like that but yeah yeah, yeah. but I, so I, basically I, with that photo everything that's in the shot there's like there's like a broken traffic light on the on the on the roadside and there's like a dude standing in the, you know on the side and blah, blah blah and like there's a lot of details in there mm-hmm. um that in my mind when i look at that photo is like uh, yeah, they probably just kind of, you know, found this location and they just, you know, obviously got the car and got the concept and everything. Um, and then just, you know, rolled with it on a date. Far from it. Every yeah. little detail was pre-planned. Every yeah. little thing. And you just go, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> like, how can you even think? Yeah. You know, and then you can very quickly realize that, of course, some people like to work like that. Yeah. And then other people just like to work in a different way. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I, yeah. I like the flexibility in, within the whole thing, you know. That sounds like uh, the shooting I in a Hollywood will, movie. I, I, I'd be willing to bet, though, that even with all of that planning that Gregory Crutzen does, because I, I get it. I mean, he, he clearly had a vision for that series, you know, because it was a whole series. Mm. And he had visions for it. They built sets for it. And, yeah. and there was a lot of decisions that got made between time of idea conception to time of completion and i guarantee somewhere in that space things morphed and maybe changed based off of changing vision so right. even though it seems like he planned everything to a t and ultimately he did i bet you right up until the day there was something where he was like oh i wanted the car this way but i think i'm going to move it this way yeah. and then yeah, yeah well you know, it's, it's that because it, even if it's a small thing you know because yeah. I, I do i do believe in planning i didn't mean to imply that like you know, screw that. Just go out there. (laughs) You should, you should have a vision. Um, but I think, you know, part of artistry is being malleable to that vision. And I think all of the, all of them are to, to one extent or another, depending on the project, you know, I, I, uh, I've watched a lot of behind the scenes stuff of Crudson's work and he is very specific. Um, and, even if he changes things, there's specificity within that vision. So um, he's he's probably more specific than some. Um, but I I remember watching him like playing with a model's hand position like five or six times to get a, a certain feel that he wanted. Mm. Um, so uh, it's interesting to see how how other people work. But Crudson's work is is amazing. It's uh, it's you know, I, if you can bring in an entire movie crew to to build you a set, I, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. The, that's like the dream, right? Yeah, I mean, his crew is inc- yeah. is incredible. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen yeah. some behind the scenes stuff of like yeah. his his action yeah, um, shooting is fifty strong. It's one, of the, it's one of the things that inspires me a lot about filmmaking. You know, I'm I'm kind of just starting to go dabble in that world and building up equipment to handle that and uh, the collaboration and the the need to get more right in camera mm. with with cinematography is a very attractive challenge to me so yeah. part of you know to to be perfectly honest there's a part of me that has i'm not going to say lost my passion for photography but i feel like everything i shoot including hotels has gotten to the point the technology is so good like 
I could blow my exposure by two stops and I'm still fine if I really need to fix it. You know, I could make any mistake out there imaginable and I can still edit my way out of it if I needed to. I try not to do that personally. I like getting things as much right in camera as I can, but, you know, hotel photography, a lot of compositing work. Um, there's a lot of, you know, light this area, light that area, put it all together and, and, you know, blend it with the natural light and get a good, you know, so, um, there's, there's an element of cinematography. that's like, no, we've got a lot less leeway to screw up. And so the stakes and, and the, the idea of getting the lighting more right in camera is, is very attractive. Um, and it, it invigorates me, um, and inspires me on a level that right currently photography doesn't necessarily do that. I, I tell you what's um, really, that's what I find interesting. What, what I find is really cool about video or cinematography in general is the fact that you have this story component in there. You know, you're telling yeah. a story over time. And that's, yeah. uh, and although, you know, of course you, you're telling a story in a photograph or you can tell a story in a photograph, that's obviously, you know, obviously, but, um, but you're not telling the story over time necessarily. And yeah. that's, and so, um, the, you know, the whole thing of like being able to reveal thing in X, uh, reveal things in X amount of different ways, whether that's through movement or, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, or no movement, or no movement, <laughs> yeah. yeah, or light or whatever yeah. it is. It's, it's a really interesting thing. We have like, we have a lot of these discussions at home because my, my wife went to film school and, okay. uh, but she's cool. like, her angle is, um, she did, she kind of focused on the script writing part of okay. it. Okay. Cool. Um, so although she's done cinematic lighting and all that kind of stuff, she doesn't yeah. know anything about it. She hates it <laughs> basically. Right. And, you know, and, um, and so she comes from a story place, you know, and, and obviously I'm, I'm a very visual person. So I come from the, the visual side of things. So, you know, it's, it's like listening to us, uh, watching just about any TV series or like, or movies kind of interesting because I'd be like, you know, oh man, look at the color grading is amazing. The way they lit this. Yeah. And she'd be like, yeah, but the dialogue is shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, okay. Well, and yeah. that's and that's the beauty of filmmaking because yeah. you need your wife as much as you need you, and yeah, exactly. and I think that is what excites me about it is um, there's the acting component, the directing component, mm -hmm. the you know right down to people watching um, you know continuity and and yeah. there's yeah. there's so many people involved in the process that I get a bigger sense of pride when we complete a project yeah. um, because it, it takes a village, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and photography, th plenty of amazing things left to learn there. And the, you know, there's still plenty of things that inspire me about it, but um, I, and, and please don't mistake this to sound arrogant, but it's, I believe that if, if somebody gave me a budget of a hundred thousand dollars and said, we want you to shoot this ad campaign, I would have no problem shooting an ad campaign that could be sold to any brand, you know, if you're given, you know, and, and that's what ends up happening. You know, you get to a successful point and, and we're all at different stages of it. Um, you know, part of my photographic career, I've been like, Oh man, I'd love to shoot, you know, the, the key art or the movie posters for this show or, or that. And, there's tons of compositing, tons of sets, tons of things that get built. You get a crew, you get a bigger budget. And, and with all that comes an element of control that you can have over a set. Um, but it's with filmmaking, it's not, it's not just me and the crew and, and everything starts to change when the camera moves and when the lighting has to move. And when you look at a film and you realize that, there's there's lights flying by when somebody's sitting in a train mm -hmm. but they're not really in a train <laughs> you gotta solve that problem of how to make all those things you know that the the, the problem solving aspect of like figuring it out and then seeing it happen and that's exciting to me whereas yeah. is uh i feel like even though i'm not at that level of shooting you know hundred thousand dollar ads for nike I'm quite confident that I could accomplish it given the budget and the time and the tools and the planning, like, it, you know, um, and I believe that, uh, you know, all uh, many photographers at various stages, whether they're at that level or not could accomplish a similar goal, you know? Um, and that's, I, you know, people might watch this and go, well, that's just bullshit, but 
Um, and, and you do, you know, I, I do believe that there's innate talents in all of us and, you know, I'm not a wedding photographer. I can, I could shoot one. I'm not going to ever sell myself one because there's really good wedding photographers out there. There's really good food photographers. So everybody's got, you know, their, their talents, but, um, I think to a degree, um, you know, budget for bigger projects, you know, cause that's kind of what I, I feel like within the industry, people talk about, well, what's the next, what's the next level? What's the next step? How do I, how do I get bigger jobs? How do I get bigger clients? How do I, and a lot of that is time in the saddle and, you know, being able to sell yourself, it's more business than it is art, you mm -hmm. know, at that, at a certain point, it's, you get an agent, you learn what the agents are looking for. You learn what the, mm -hmm. the art buyers are looking for and you go create those things. And, and, uh, it's not to say that it doesn't involve creativity because it, you know, you have to be a creative person, but, um, I just don't think the challenge is as high from a technical or even necessarily creative standpoint with photography as it is with cinematography. Um, and I think that's probably why a lot of photographers become cinematographers too. Mm -hmm. um, even before the age of YouTube and, and film, there was a lot of photographers who became filmmakers. And I think sometimes it's just that need to like, I, I as simply as I could put it, I, I like to say that I want to start seeing my pictures move. Simple yeah. as that. Like, I just want to see movement in the frame. When I think of a picture, I always think of a movie. And well, so it's funny how it's, it's funny how in, in like in movies, the, the, the main camera guy mm -hmm. is known as the director of photography. Yeah. I mean, that's just basically really says it all. But you know, the, the really fun thing that for me always, uh, when it comes to uh, working on video productions is just the, the collaborative creative effort. You know, one one of the things, just very briefly coming back to the pandemic thing, you know, the thing that I really missed, I think more than anything else was the inability of working with other people in a yeah. team, you know, whether yeah. it's one assistant or, or like a whole team of people. And, um, you know, and that's one of the things I've, I've really been enjoying the most since, yeah. since, you know, things have opened up again, um, is that actually I don't have to, you know, shoot some products in my house by myself, you know, right. I can now go out, you know, and, and Nick and me have been out on, on several uh, productions, you know, working together. Like we've shot, we did a video production over several days in the streaming rain. Yeah. <laughs> it was freaking horrendous, but it was fun, man. It was so much fun, you know, just doing like both video and audio in the pouring yeah. rain uh, was challenging, but at the same time, it was awesome. Yeah. It yeah. was super fun, you know? But it's just this well, whole good thing audio. Where, I mean, that's a whole other, yeah. you know, good audio is a whole other component that that yeah. uh, often gets overlooked, but is so crucial. And and you know, yeah. the fun thing is like when you do a take, uh, everything has to move together. You yeah, know, the actors, the camera, the sound, everything has to everything has to move together. Um, yeah. The props, whatever it is, you know, so that it really is a. To a totally collaborative effort of, of making yeah. this particular, you know, shot happen. That's, I really enjoy that. That's, that's, um, it's a whole different experience from setting everything up and then clicking the shutter button. And then, yeah. 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 yeah and it, I, I never wanted it to sound like I was downplaying the, the technical significance or creative significance of photography. Cause that's, that's not really what I mean. Um, but it's, it's, uh, I do believe that, each medium has its challenges hmm. and each medium has things that are easy about it. Um, I am not as well skilled in filmmaking. So the things that I'm learning are exciting. Um, whereas I have a lot more technical knowledge of the, photo, you know, the photographic process and have a pretty solid understanding of lighting that, you know, I'm not afraid to tackle any challenge. Now I might fail too, you know, like I, I didn't really mention that, like you might give me a Nike, you know, campaign <laughs> and I might totally shit the bet on it. You know, I don't know, but, um, but I, but I it feel more comfortable and more confident tackling that problem. Yeah. And to me, because I feel more comfortable with it, it's almost less, you know, like it, it it's almost a little less exciting. Now, 
if somebody was like, here, shoot this Nike campaign, I'd be over the moon excited. But um, I, I'm much more excited about the prospect of doing cinematography for a student film. Okay. And that's, that's a personal thing. You know, it's like right now where I am in my life and my own creative head, like that, excite that, that excites me more. Um, but I would take, I would take a Nike challenge any day of the week. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's your, like, what, what is your plan with your, um, with the cinematography and the filmmaking side of things? Like, what, is there anything specifically you're working on? Um, at the moment? Well, yeah, I actually, uh, one of my clients, so I got into this, uh, creative collective called the Atlas company. Um, and it's, it's a collective of like people who are actors and writers and whatever, and they're all, you know, trying to find their way in this business too. Nobody's overly, you know, it, to my knowledge, it's, it's not a big thing. You know, it's just a group of 20 some odd people and, And I photographed a few of them and, and, uh, my friend Roger said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm part of this creative collective and you want to get into filmmaking. We want to film some scenes for our reels and stuff like that. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I, I fell into it. And so they sent me a script just now, um, of a project that they want to shoot the end of this month, maybe early next month. Um, And it's exciting. Uh, they're in talks to be able to shoot it at a uh, an actual theater. Um, it's based kind of in a in a theater, and uh, so a lot of technical challenges to look at there, and and moving you know the camera and lighting, and you know it's it's an exciting thing to try and visualize how to tell the story, and and I when I read a script, if I start getting visuals um of frames you know if i see the people talking um that's that's kind of what excites me um some things i'm not really you know i like you know i'm probably like like you in a sense like i like dark and moody stuff you know i i so i i tend to gravitate more towards something more dramatic and more serious this is not that it's a it's a comedy so that's an interesting challenge um, and like I said, I'm still learning a lot about the whole process. You know, I, uh, am very new to it, which is scary because I'm also going to be 39 this year and it feels like way too late to be doing this. <laughs> like, am I just, am I just the old guy in the room with the toys? I don't know, but it's, um, you know, if it, it still feels good. So like, I don't give a shit, you know, we'll, we'll just do it. And, uh, I, what I, what I have to keep coming back to is trusting, trusting what I do know, you know, and I, I have a good understanding of light and what I like and what I don't like, and I know how to light things and, you know, and, and not be afraid to, you know, I think sometimes as creatives, we, we don't ever want to come across like we're arrogant. And so we never really talk about the trust we need to have in ourselves mm -hmm. um, to be able to do what we want to do. And so even me, you know, getting into cinematography, like it's scary. And I'm like, what am I really trying to do? What am I really trying to accomplish? And at the end of the day, I don't have any long-term goal for it. I would love to get paid to make films, um, whatever that means. So we've had a little chat off camera and we're going to challenge Dylan to a video challenge. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. So, um, you know, keep your eyes peeled. We're going to be back sometime in August, I think. And it's going to be super fun. We're not going to reveal at this point what it's going to be. But it is going to be sexy. Oh, yeah. Definitely Without sexy. a doubt. Damn sexy. Definitely For sexy. Sure. Yeah. 100%. No strip paper. Well, no strip paper. Well, mm. I can't promise that. I mean, it's, you mm. know. <laughs> I'm feeling froggy. I don't know. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so we have come to the end of uh, this week's episode. Dylan, thank you so much for being on the show. It was an absolute education. Thanks for having me. We'll have you back um, in a few weeks' time, which will be awesome, no doubt. Um, that being said, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, <laughs> make sure you head over to YouTube where you can see us in full Technicolor. Um, if you are there, just hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, you know, all the other stuff that YouTubers usually tell you to do. That would be great. Um, but without further ado, we'll be back next week. Bye.